talking about financialization in Turkey. This panel is uh, organized by the Debt and Financialization Research Network Turkey, the recently founded uh, <coughs> research collaboration network that focuses on issues of debt and financialization in Turkey. We are trying to eliminate different aspects of financialization in Turkey. And we are um, happily supported by the Research Institute on Turkey. You can find more information about this uh, on defire.info. If you're interested, we'll be posting the video recordings of this, as well as the audio recordings online, and uh, most probably also the presentations, uh, if all authors uh, agree to present, uh, to, uh, to publish this. Uh, we will uh, start off with a paper on financialization and housing. Uh, Özlem will be presenting the paper that is co-authored with Elif, who is sitting in the audience today. And uh, I would like to uh, pass it on to Özlem, who is a research fellow at the Middle East Technical University in the Turkey. Okay, thanks, Bert, and thanks for organization. For thanks for organizing the whole session. Uh, I just need to find my oh, PT As Bert mentioned, this is a, a this is a co-authored paper with Elif, uh, and uh, this is also a work in progress. So we uh, recently started to work on financialization, financialization. I mean, finance and construction and housing sector in Turkey together. We do we separately do other things, but uh, we started to work together recently. And today uh, we're going to talk about the historical background of housing and its relation to finance in Turkey and we'll try to put the arguments of ours in its place 
Uh, and then we are going to focus on the relation between finance and construction and housing sector, but uh, looking at the relation between development finance and household finance. And we will conclude with the concluding remarks. So uh, this paper is focused on uh, post-2001. Uh, so if, uh, you're going to get just a little bit of information about what happened previously. Uh, in post-2001 era, it was the integration of Turkey into the world economy through capital and trade. And uh, the main uh, drivers of the economic growth was consumption and construction in that period. Uh, when we come to the 2007 and 8 crisis, the state, uh, the, the involvement of the state in the, uh, in the economy and also in the housing sector and construction sector has been upward rescaled, especially through the, uh, the new institution, actually it was an old institution, but an uh, empowered institution called Mass Housing Administration in Turkey, which is under the control of Prime Minister. And uh, after 2007 and 8 crisis, economic growth has been slowed down and ever since there have been fluctuations in the economy. And this created concerns regarding the credit-driven construction-based growth after that period. So uh, when we look at the, uh, the, an overview of the period, the construction sector uh, has, a peak, uh, has a growth between 2002 and 2007, and then a sharp decrease after it, during the crisis and after the crisis. <coughs> and then it started to grow again in 2009, but uh, but now uh, it is again uh, going. Uh, it is again declining in the in the last couple of years. Uh, but uh, the importance in in this figure is the the construction sector and GDP growth rates were always parallel to each other. And it is also evident in the uh, in the rise in the construction permits for the new built housing in Turkey. It it rises. Uh, it rises through time uh, when we come to 2014. So uh, when you think about housing and it is finance, there are different approaches to understand housing and finance. But our starting point is housing is not like any other commodity in the market. It is a different commodity. Uh, and it is the, the peculiarity of housing is it is multidimensional. It is embedded in multidimensional relations, including the relations between capital, labor, the state and finance, and, and those relations are not conflict-free, rather they are conflict-ridden. Uh, so especially the, uh, the role of labor in this process is threefold. First, we see labor in the production process, we see labor in the reproduction process, but not only the reproduction of labor force itself, but the reproduction of human beings, I guess, to, to grow, live and enjoy life and housing is a peculiar part of it. And uh, what is different in housing uh, from different commodities, labor itself starts to be the consumer in the whole process, which also produces the whole process. And when we look at the finance side, uh, laborers and consumers give, and, and also developers, are in a long-term commitment in the, financial, in the financialization of housing. And, uh, and especially in Turkey, the role of the state is uh, it taking a major role because it intervenes differently in different times and in different localities, as we see in the case of Istanbul or Ankara. So we have the, the role of the state is major, but also differentiates from each other from time and uh, during, the, during different times and during, uh, on different localities. So the whole multidimensional relations make construction-led growth fragile. So when we look at the, um, the relationship between finance and construction and housing sector, uh, we, we focused on both sides, the household and development finance, because in the literature you either find a focus on household finance or in the development finance. But according to us, it, they have a relational, uh, they, have, they, they work relationally, so we need to look at both sides of, what size of it. And this two-way relationship works through uh, the, the peculiarity of housing or real estate itself, because real estate is investment is more than special fix for over-accumulated capital. 
It is important to focus on the complex and TV relationship between finance and real estate investments. <coughs> and secondly, it also entails state interventions aiming at shaping the financial circuit, uh, like, like emergence of new financial agents or new regulations of the state in different times. So we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. So we, when we look at the development of finance in Turkey, a very brief historical background, in the 1960s, we had a different finance system for housing. It was mainly two things, a build and sell system, which were targeting the transformation of Gecekondu settlements and uh, squatter houses. And the, the squatter houses turned into uh, turned the, the, their involved in market relations through build and sell system. So they were the small contractors who were involved and uh, transferred, ha transferred houses into apartment blocks, basically. And the second one was affordable housing for civil servants and workers in that period. Uh, but the, the importance of affordable housing in that period, because it changed now, uh, it was it was wage indexed housing loans. So it was indexed to a wage when you were buying the house. And uh, the the institutions who were, who were giving that uh, finance was Emnat uh, Credit Bank, which was which was state owned land bank, and uh, the second one was Social Security Fund. When we come to 1980s, uh, we only see one kind. As, like the major financing is mass housing production through the, uh, the, the previous form of mass housing administration. Mass housing fund was giving mass housing uh, finance to the producers. And, the, and wage index loans diminished in that period, especially the social security fund uh, was not uh, there anymore. So it was only the, uh, the, the credit bank. So when we look at 2000s in development finance, which is a major change from the previous periods, uh, we see three things. Rise in bank loans, increased overseas borrowing, and emergence of new financial agents. So if you look closely to what happens, we see in this graph uh, that a, the, the, the loans getting from uh, the banks uh, has risen uh, all from the 2002 and today. Uh, and when we, sit, when we look at the increased overseas borrowing, uh, we see a rise uh, between 2008 and 2012, and then uh, a, a, re, a, sorry, a decrease uh, when we're coming to, uh, to, 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 to today, today. And um, increased overseas borrowing have an importance in Turkey because uh, this, cre this creates an um, attachment to the international market itself. However, they gain uh, their money when they sell the house in, in Turkish liras. So it makes the, the market itself very fragile as well because it, was, it is dependent on the international <coughs> markets and also it is dependent on the crisis tendencies in the international market so it has a direct effect. And the third one is the emergence of new financial agents in Turkey after 2000s. The main one is the real estate investment trusts. You can see in the figure that it, uh, the number of them, at uh, the number, number of the uh, rates, and also the value in the market started to rise when we come to the 2014. Uh, but uh, I think, the, the, according to us, the main importance of rates is uh, they they are not like the construction firms in the in the market. The difference is they don't sell the houses, but uh, they sell the, the value of it in the market, so, so they don't sell the, 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 uh, the house itself. Uh, so this tree is the main dynamics behind the finance and housing in Turkey, but we, we also remind ourselves when we're looking at these three dynamics that there is an indirect involvement of the state in Turkey for these three different finance tools. So. Uh, the state gives provision of land to invest with no cost or low cost and gives tax discount and also it uses a revenue sharing model, the mass housing administration model, selling, giving the land free or uh, giving it with, not with low cost to the investor and then getting the money from that to invest in affordable housing in the peripheries of the city. And the land they are giving uh, are 
on the valuable land in the city centers. So giving such subsidies, so what happens when you give that, uh, that kind of subsidies, uh, the, uh, the interest of capital groups who weren't active in the construction sector start to be active in the construction sector, which are like, including textile, pharmaceutical, or electronic sectors. So when we look at the other side of the finance, is, which is the household finance in Turkey, there has been a variety of uh, housing provision before the 2000s, as I just mentioned before, whether cooperatives, rented social housing for civil servants, or mass, or mass housing. But in 2000s, we experienced a radical change, and the, the main idea of getting a house, or on, the only way of getting a house, is to buy one. So it is the private home ownership. And, uh, this demand uh, created through indebtedness. <coughs> so when you look at the Turkey's consumer credit to GDP between 2002 and 2014, you see that the, uh, the credit cards and uh, personal loans and housing loans are rising, but the housing loans are taking the lead in that, in that period. So to conclude, um, Actually, it is very difficult to get an uh, analysis of what's happening in the construction sector and housing sector. We are just in the beginning of it, so, uh, so this is our starting point, let's say, because it's a, it's a multi-dimensional uh, relations between state, capital, labor, and finance. But um, the success of housing and construction that growth depends very much on borrowing by lower income uh, groups, and however, they are the first ones who are going to be hit by a crisis. That's why uh, the, the, the Turkey is also Turkey is a, a crisis from country, and that's why it is, in, uh, it is very much dependent on the international markets. So the whole system turns into a very fragile uh, economic system. And, uh, and the last point, this whole process brings a series of state intervention which we didn't mention like separately in here. Uh, but it is the, the interventions of the state mainly based on to overcome the, the obstacles between, uh, between the relation, when, when a relation occurs between developers and developers, or developers and the state, or the developers and the state. Uh, so uh, what is going on in Turkey is a resistance from grassroots uh, against uh, credit system, also home owner, private home ownership, and this has an importance uh, in putting the barriers to the success of construction that growth since 2000s in Turkey. So, thank you. Kuei, at the end? Yes, we will have a Q&A session towards the end of the session. Um, so let's move on with Yetkim. He, Yetkin Borlu is a postdoc at Penn State University. Uh, he's also a high school friend of mine. It's very, very rare that uh, you, ha you happen to be presenting on the same panel as your high school friends. The, he, his paper will be on um, right here. Uh, farming and financialization in Turkey. Let me just uh, bring this up. So, yeah, I'm a uh, postdoctoral research associate right now at Penn State. I uh, finished my PhD uh, degree uh, last year, uh, 2014 May. And this is just part of my, <coughs> this is a, like a piece from my uh, dissertation. It's forthcoming in rural sociology as well. So um, I'm really happy uh, to be able to uh, share this with you because it's a relatively new piece and I will be really happy to get your feedback, to your thoughts, because I'm having, uh, doing a little bit of a mind exercise here about how we can look at the issue of uh, financialization, how it applies to um, agriculture, and especially to a structure, a cultural structure, or any other economy structure, really, where we will see uh, a, number, a large number of uh, small-scale investors producers, however we want to think about it, and how their dependence on credits as a consequence of financialization um, improves some of the uh, 
might improve some of the uh, conditions they have, uh, given the limitations, of course, and how it uh, might put them, put those small-scale uh, producers, investors, um, entrepreneurs, as uh, the, uh, some of the economists like to call, right? How, uh, what kind of a disposi uh, disadvantage position uh, does their dependence on credits uh, put them into? So, uh, yeah, and just uh, corn production in Turkey. Uh, as a new uh, area of uh, economic production, it's just a case. Uh, just to think about the uh, ways about credit dependence and uh, small scale uh, investment. So, I want to give you a little bit of a background uh, about agricultural production and uh, Turkey. Um, as Özlem mentioned, uh, just like in uh, household, in the household sector, in the uh, development household. Uh, house development sector, uh, a culture, the agricultural sector has experienced went through an uh, important restructuring as well, economic adjustment, right? Especially after the uh, economic crisis uh, uh, in 2001. So uh, the previous uh, cultural system uh, was dependent on um, on state support, right? This state support was uh, channeled through um, state-owned uh, enterprises. Uh, as well as uh, press supports given by these uh, state-owned enterprises, as well as state-supported uh, producing cooperatives. So, uh, price support was really the backbone uh, of the system. So, in the two, after 2001 crisis, uh, we see a major restructuring with the, the story we must have, most of us are uh, familiar with, right? The uh, adjustment, uh, structural adjustment conditions uh, put by uh, forced by IMF and as well as the World Bank. So we see, we've seen a phase out of government supports uh, in agriculture, especially in price supports and in input subsidies. Uh, another uh, condition, another uh, uh, condition for economic restructuring was uh, privatization of state enterprises. We have seen uh, privatization in tobacco production. Uh, the state enterprises in tobacco production are privatized right now. <coughs> the uh, sugar, beet, uh, sugar pro producing state enterprises are on the agenda of uh, privatization and people are right now concerned about whether uh, tea production enterprises, uh, tea enterprises are going to be privatized as well. So uh, in this period, especially starting in the early 2000s, we see an increase in the uh, corporate activity, like the, uh, the increasing role of the corporations uh, in the in the agricultural sector, uh, some of the uh, sociologists, agricultural sociologists, call this as like a shift to a corporate regime, like corporate food regime. So, uh, in line with this, at the same time, we see a decrease in the number of producers, right? I mean, most of you guys in this room are probably familiar with the uh, agriculture, like landholders, land holding structure <coughs> in, in Turkey. Um, uh, most of the uh, land is held by the uh, small scale and medium scale uh, producers in Turkey. And uh, large scale producers are more regionally concentrated, but their numbers as well as uh, their uh, land hold, like sharing land holdings, uh, is uh, lower than small and medium scale producers. So, uh, keeping this structure in mind, there has been a significant decrease in the number of producers, right, from 8 million producers in terms of employment um, to 6 million producers. And at the same time, we've seen a uh, decrease in the uh, withdrawal in the uh, production of conventional crops that were supported by the state enterprises uh, in the pre-2001 uh, context, like conventional crops like sugar beets, right, tobacco, tea, uh, as well as cotton. Uh, cotton was uh, one of the major crops, staple crops for small scale producers uh, that supported their livelihoods uh, over the years in, in this like state supported uh, agricultural system. Right? So, uh, this overall shift just represents a shift from a state supported system to a corporate uh, market system. So, uh, where does, what does corn present, like maize represent in this shift? It was one of the important alternative crops and uh, we've seen a uh, big push from the uh, corporations 
in the market uh, that are dependent on uh, maize production, like sweeteners, sweetener producers, uh, as well as uh, animal feed producers. So, in terms of sweeteners, you can think about you can think about Cargill, one of the large uh, corporations that are active uh, in in Turkey, and one of the uh, important uh, corporations, family-owned corporations, so not not a public one, uh, in the United States. Uh, in terms of um, uh, feed production, we see the, uh, another corporation called CP. It's a Thai uh, corporation uh, that is one of which is the largest uh, feed pro producer uh, across the world. So, and that is the that uh, leads the feed production in Turkey as a uh, large share in the feed production uh, sector. And those two industries are really pushing. Uh, corn production, like creating the de demand uh, in, in, uh, in Turkish markets. So, looking at it from an input perspective, right? When we look at inputs, seed is the most important one. High high yield varieties, uh, uh, corn seeds that are not traditional, right? Not like sweet corn, but a type of uh, corn that is used for industrial processing, right? Uh, that is most of that. Uh, corn is produced by Monsanto, DuPont, and Syngenta, uh, three large uh, global uh, biotech <coughs> companies that invest in, in uh, creating high yield uh, varieties, especially in seed, soybeans, uh, wheat, and corn being just one of them. And yeah, when we look at the consumption side, 90% of the corn being produced over the 2000s uh, in Turkey is being absorbed, being consumed by these corporations. Uh, by sweetener and um, animal feed uh, producing companies, right? So, in a, in a way, the producers uh, are shifting from a state-supported system to a system where they basically uh, producing uh, for corporations, right? So, kind of providing an input uh, for uh, providing a raw material uh, for the for an industry, rather than just selling it by themselves out on the market. So where does financialization uh, fit in this picture, right? So <coughs> uh, looking at financialization, you can look at consumption credits, right? Like credit, uh, uh, consumer credits, as well as uh, in, the, in the case of Özlem talked about, um, we talk about a lot about uh, credits being used for um, uh, residential investments, but uh, in terms of production too, credits are a really important uh, part, uh, a factor of financialization. With increasing financialization, we see a larger dependency uh, in the economy uh, on credits, which is the case in Turkey as well, especially in agricultural production. So the um, agricultural credit supply uh, increased from $4 billion to $22 billion just in how many years, like seven years, and in 2004 figures, sorry, 2014 figures, was around uh, 32 billion uh, Turkish liras. And so, and it's, it's quite a jump, and it's quite an increase uh, in terms of uh, agricultural production depending on, on credits. So, you can just think about this as a shift from uh, agricultural producers uh, just relying on uh, state supports, getting better prices from its state enterprises as well as uh, credit unions to a model where they rely on credits and produce for corporations, right? So, the, I'll just give you a little bit of sociological background just to confuse a little bit more. So, uh, in terms of financialization, there are two aspects uh, as well as economic restructuring. There are uh, two, uh, two main perspectives about the consequences uh, of this process. So one, one is just uh, like fields like uh, geography, uh, like economic anthropology, as well as sociologists use really intensively. Dispossession, right? Disp accumulation by dispossession. Uh, it's similar uh, conceptualizations like enclosure, right? Um, which, represents one of the consequences, potential consequences, especially for small-scale 
producers, investments. You can think about like just small scale farmers or just someone who owns a, a small scale workshop, right? Trying to uh, produce something by themselves, but using microcredits, right? But then the, uh, the story that we hear most of the time, it's not a story, of course, it's reality. Uh, but uh, most of the focus is, is on how these small scale producers cannot really cope with the burdens of, of debt and credits, especially mic microcredits, and then just give up, sell their uh, assets, so sell all their investments, or it's being appropriated by the crediting institutions, right? That is the um, focus uh, most of the time when we talk about financialization, and especially within the, the microcredit uh, context. There is another um, uh, perspective, though, that doesn't like, really exclude the consequences, the real consequences of uh, this possession, but adds a little bit more detail about what, what can about what can happen uh, when small-scale producers, small-scale investors use uh, credits, which is the the idea is that small-scale producers can be integrated, can be an integral part uh, of of the corporate markets and can function within that, right? Uh, of course, the story doesn't end there, right? So I'm trying to take that one step further. Okay, what happens to small-scale producers uh, who depend on uh, credits and are struggling to, to sustain their livelihoods with the help of, uh, not with the help of, but depending on, on credits? So just, uh, it's, it's a rather uh, Turkish, audience here, uh, I thought uh, if, if there were a little bit of a more uh, American audience, uh, I could give some uh, examples for that. But let's say the farm crisis in the United States in the Midwest uh, in the 1980s <coughs> and the elimination of like, the uh, decline in the numbers of small scale producers uh, is one example for this possession, right? Uh, integration of small, small farms uh, in the context of agriculture. Uh, we can talk about uh, uh, small-scale producers, simple commodity producers, being really driving the driving force uh, behind the commercialization of export agriculture uh, in the south, in Southeast Asia, and especially like special specialty crops. Um, think like I, I can't really think about a uh, specialty crop here, but um, more specialty crops like coffee or. Uh, bananas, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, we see small-scale producers being really active agents uh, participating in export markets. So there are these two perspectives that like do we really have, like does one have to exclude the other one or can we really come to a, a more comprehensive framework that we, where we can really uh, understand the um, consequences of financialization and credit expansion for small-scale producers, right? So this is just my main question. <coughs> so what are the potential consequences of financialization uh, besides this possession? Right? What, what other consequences can we think about, right? So I came up with this uh, idea, with this concept of entrepreneurial exploitation, right? How can you make an investment but still be exploited as a small-scale producer? So the gist of this, really, the main idea behind all this, when you have a market structure that, uh, that where there is a large number of small-scale producers, right, who are dependent on credits, they, are, they might derive some profits from this investment, right? But for sure they are going to have lower returns because, because of their dependency on credits. So their dependence on credits is, is going to decrease their bargaining power, right? They have power to bargain with the um, industry um, uh, of the sector they are investing in. Right? So, whereas large-scale producers or investors who have a larger access to resources, right, who are not uh, as much dependent on uh, credits, I mean, they can use credits or they might not. Right? It's kind of a uh, choice for them. Right? So they can dis uh, transcend this dependency. Uh, I mean, you, credit usage doesn't really represent a dependency for them, right? Because they can invest in the market otherwise as well, right? They have a higher bargaining power, they get better uh, deals, uh, and they, they have higher returns for
from that. So I'm, I'm just really interested in how small scale producers or investors are participating in a sector uh, which is largely dominated by uh, corporate demand, right? by, by private demand, uh, instead of being supported by, by uh, different state mechanisms. So, uh, what did I do in my case to support all these claims uh, and this idea of entrepreneurial exploitation? <coughs> I did a really short uh, field research. Before this, to support uh, all this field research, I played around with numbers a little bit, ran some statistical models, and I thought, okay, I think I should just really focus on, on some regions uh, where there are uh, uh, more higher likelihood to run into small-scale producers and get their perspectives uh, about how they decide to uh, shift to corn production, which is an alternative crop for them, right? Uh, whereas they were producing other crops that were supported by dif different state enterprises. And uh, what kind of different answers can I get from them? So I did that, uh, my field research in Sakarya, uh, which is uh, like northwestern um, area, uh, region in, in Turkey. <coughs> where uh, corn actually grows naturally, right? But there is a, a long past of uh, industrial corn production as well, um, where farmers have been ha had a, a long experience with uh, uh, high yield uh, corn production. And whereas in Izmir and Manisa region, uh, people were uh, producing, were involved with corn production, uh, more so in the in the two thousands, uh, late nineties. Uh, but more so early 2000s, and the yields have been increasing in this region. More and more farmers have been investing uh, in corn production. So I just wanted to uh, compare these two regions and see how different uh, small-scale farms with different backgrounds uh, make these decisions uh, to invest, and what the consequences are. Right? So, first group of findings, decline in the forest regime, uh, it's just this like state-supported uh, system of agriculture, right? How that uh, shift happens uh, and is replaced actually for the most part with, uh, with corn production. So um, in Izmir and Manisa region, cotton was one of the uh, large uh, commercial crops for small scale producers, I mean as well as large scale producers, but because there was state support behind that, um, it, was, it was still a crop that was uh, being produced by small scale producers and they were uh, receiving, getting some profits from this. And in the uh, Sakarya region, uh, sugar beet production uh, was, um, was another uh, crop, um, another sector where they were getting um, uh, deriving profits. And the uh, factory in, in Sakarya, as well as all across Turkey, right now they are being trying, uh, the, there is an agenda to privatize uh, all these factories, is, is a state owned factory. There was a state-owned factory, uh, but it got privatized uh, in the, um, after uh, like mid 2000s. So uh, the market conditions, in short, for cotton uh, sector as well as for the sugar beet sector became unpredictable uh, for for producers, for small-scale producers. So they were not able to, uh, they they were not uh, assured about the. Uh, uh, future of these crops, whereas at, uh, in, when, when you look at corn, there is an increasing demand from corporations um, who are processing all, all, this crop, uh, all this corn being produced. So uh, on the one hand, you have a, like an unpredictable uh, conventional crop market sector uh, like sugar beets and uh, cotton. On the other hand, you have an increasing demand from corporations or corn, so uh, producers uh, had, a, had a more economic incentive to shift to corn uh, for, to make money, right? But all the context is changing, uh, all the context of the sector is changing, uh, as well as the crop itself. So the crop shift really, shifting crop really represents a, a shift in the uh, type of production and relations of labor, uh, rather than just like a simple shift, oh, I'm not going to produce corn, so I'm not going to produce cotton or sugar beets, I just want to <coughs> produce corn. It's the underlying mechanisms are more representative of a, a system a regime change uh, along with relations of labor. So uh, another factor why 
farmers want to, wanted to uh, shift to corn production is because, especially for cotton, uh, for cotton production, they were able to eliminate labor costs, manual labor costs, uh, which, is, which has been an increasing, um, I'm not going to say problem, but uh, cost of production. So with, with a shift to uh, corn production, which is all mechanized from planting to uh, harvesting, they were able to eliminate all the production costs. So they didn't need any more labor, especially in the western regions of Izmir and Manisa. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, they, they saw uh, as a benefit of shifting to corn. Whereas the, uh, the diversity of the crops uh, they are producing, at least for, for cash, uh, has declined over time, right? So, the other uh, group of findings which relates uh, to the influence of, of credit use uh, and dependence on credits um, in, the, in the production of uh, corn. So, uh, corn production has high costs, right? Uh, the seed is commercial, uh, all the, for the, all the mechanical processes like from planting to harvesting we need to pay cash so small scale uh, especially medium scale farmers find it dif difficult to uh, fund it by themselves uh, fund, uh, find resources uh, to cover all these costs so they resort to credits right so that's where the dependence really comes in dependence on credit comes in so and when we look at the, um, as I mentioned uh, previously uh, just like the general um, a cultural structure in Turkey, uh, the, in corn production as well, the majority of producers, just in numbers, uh, represent the majority. And so if you see a, a large pool of uh, raw material suppliers who are dependent on credits, right? Uh, but uh, of course this, this dynamic represents the production uh, patterns of small and medium scale producers. But when we look at small scale producers, we see uh, another source of credits. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Uh, the, the majority of funds credits come from uh, private and public uh, banks, but small scale farmers are more likely to resort to their own merchants, right? Who uh, they sell their produce to as a source of credit, right? At the beginning of planting season, they just get credits, advanced uh, cre um, credits for. Um, seeds as well as uh, fertilizer right and with the condition um, of paying all this uh, at the beginning of the harvest season right but in that case when they make that deal with the, uh, with a merchant they seriously um, limit their uh, con their choices of marketing because they have to sell to the same person at the end of the harvest season so uh, on top of depending on credits right uh, they have they are limited um, uh, in terms of uh, marketing options as well uh, if they uh, decided to get credits from from a merchant so all this brings us to the conclusion that um, use of credits right uh, especially if the small scale producers uh, get credits uh, from merchants uh, are uh, are losing their position of bargaining, right? uh, losing a, a significant uh, bargaining power. Uh, one of the factory owners uh, I interviewed uh, told me, uh, he was like really honest about that. Like at first he was like really uh, difficult to talk to, but after talking a while, he was, uh, he, he, he was more uh, open about his opinions. So at the end, towards the end of, of his, uh, of the interview, he told me dealing with large scale farmers is difficult because they have a, a higher bargaining power, right? The small scale farmers are easier, you send the trucks, pay them, receive the produce, end of the deal, right? It's pretty easy and quick. So, what are the conclusions, right? Uh, large number of small scale farmers uh, and their dependence on credits contributes to exploitation by the industry and um, of course, in order to generalize this, because this is just a case study, right? And I had I a little bit of the theoretical discussion about this. In order to generalize, I think we need a bit more, uh, more research, more, more studies. And I think um, looking at other sectors would be really useful as well, in order, in order to look at uh, 
uh, impacts of uh, credit dependence of small scale producers. So uh, I think entrepreneurial exploitation could be adopted, it could be used in, I mean, it doesn't have to be called entrepreneurial exploitation, but this idea of credit dependence of small scale producers can be found in other economic sectors as well. Yep. Yeah. References and my contact if you guys want to get in touch with me. All right. Uh, well, thanks so much. We're going to move on with uh, Adi Rizal again, who is a <coughs> postdoc at Queen's University in, in Canada, and he'll be talking about financial inclusion in Turkey. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'll take my time, but uh, mine is largely descriptive. Uh, just I will try to clarify my position regarding financialization and financialization of the state at the beginning of the presentation and at the end. Uh, I hope to turn the paper into an article and uh, it will also form a basis for further research, I will, uh, if I can find the uh, funds, I will uh, try to analyze the impact of microcredits uh, in regional and local development in Black Sea region of Turkey, but it, it depends on how my studies develop. So this is uh, actually the outline of the paper as well. Uh, I will not uh, dwell on the uh, very much on microcredit, <coughs> but um, I will try to. I'm trying to drive from uh, previous studies and try to form a framework for analyzing financial inclusion. So I will um, rest on uh, the descri description and analysis of three pillars. Uh, which is the strategy formation uh, and financial sector development. The second one is financial literacy and education, and the third one is uh, microfinance or microcredit. Uh, so I will try to uh, talk about how these three pillars are uh, working right now in Turkey, and what is the role of the state. My major argumentation is uh, my major argument is that. Uh, we can take financial inclusion as, a, as an aspect of financialization and the specificity of the Turkish case is that uh, the state has a proactive role uh, in all of these pillars but most notably in strategy formation and uh, microcredit sector. So I'm taking, I'm, I'm referring to uh, David McNally's definition of financialization. It's um, embedding labor capital and capital capital relations in interest paying financial transactions. So, um, and I believe that financial inclusion can be seen as an aspect of uh, financial relation in, the, in this regard. But when I, when I, um, when I, um, let's say, deep, try to deep, uh, try to dive deep in the literature, I, I saw that uh, those who relates financial inclusion with financialization mostly focus on microcredit and securitization of microcredit. Uh, but um, now the Turkish case differs from that, but still uh, I believe the road uh, and the trajectory shows that um, we, we, are, we are witnessing the increased integration of individuals and households into the financial sector uh, with the help of state policies, despite the state-organized microcredit sector and despite the non-commercialized uh, microcredit sector. So I will try to explain that as well. Um, <coughs> now, just, just to clarify before going on, uh, the, um, the most uh, quoted definition of financial inclusion is removing the barriers in front of access to formal finance. 
formal financial institutions. But World Bank, in a way, revised the uh, definition within years. So the last global financial index, in their last global financial index, which has been released in the last week or so, uh, they, um, they also emphasize the financial literacy and education uh, aspect. Um, access is not enough in their terms. Um, we, we also need to increase financial awareness, to use their terminology, so that people, uh, people use the services, people become a part of the financial system, let's say. Uh, and, I, and I also tried to um, differentiate in the paper with uh, through a kind of demarcation with democratization of finance and financial inclusion, which I, I see as the uh, democratization, democratization of finance as uh, the provision of costly financial services to low-income households, whereas financial inclusion can actually uh, include the infrastructural development let's say, financial, the development of the financial sector. Uh, and, and also the, the, um, the discourse revolving around this notion of financial inclusion has pretty much something to do with development uh, framework. And it's, it's like a remedy to offer it to uh, global self uh, and by international financial institutions that claim if you, uh, if you develop the financial services, if you raise the financial awareness, if you literally educate the people, then, <coughs> then you will find the, uh, the funds thanks to the savings of the individual and the households. Um, so in the literature, you see that uh, um, when, when people talk about financialization, uh, with regards to financial inclusion, they pretty much talk about securitization of microcredit and the activities of for-profit microfinance institutions. Um, we know that this uh, resulted in uh, over-indebted households, as in the case of India, Andhra Pradesh, or, uh, um, or Bosnia Herzegovina, and it also led to uh, microfinance institutions' mat meltdowns. So I'm, uh, I'm trying, as I said, I'm trying to form a framework to analyze uh, financial inclusion. So I'm uh, modifying Michael Chiba's work, uh, uh, who states actually that countries learn from previous experiences, and we have hybrid models for financial inclusion. So in order to uh, relate this issue of financial inclusion with financialization, we need to take into consideration this hybridization. So I'm suggesting that we need to look at strategy formation, we need to look at financial literacy campaigns and the microcredit sector. So in Turkish case, uh, the policy document, which is actually, as confirmed by the Under Secretariat of Treasury, which is actually the financial inclusion strategy uh, has been promulgated, uh, has been uh, published in the official gazette last year, the strategy for financial access, financial education, the protection of financial consumers and action plans. When you, when you look at the document, uh, um, the strategy aims to address the gender gap in accessing financial services. It declares its aim as the protection of financial consumers and to increase financial awareness in collaboration with uh, non-governmental organizations and, uh, and commercial banks. However, I believe the strategy is protecting the financial sector as um, it does not question the provision of service, provision of financial services. It is explicitly stated in the strategy that uh, the banking sector in Turkey is developed. Uh, banking, sector, banking sector in Turkey has developed so much that there is no problem uh, regarding the reach, regarding the supply of financial services. Well, the only problem is the, uh, is the financial, um, financially illiterate uh, 
uh, individuals and the households that do not uh, know how to use the financial services. So that's why uh, the strategy focuses on financial literacy and education. And another critique that can be directed to the strategy is that the neglect of the, uh, the wage skews and the informal sector in Turkey. As you all know, almost 40% of the labor force uh, is working in informal sector, uh, which supports the informal financial mechanisms and informal credit mechanisms. Uh, there is no mentioning of this informal sector uh, in the document as well. Um, so, I, so I believe that this is an ex this is a this is an example of spa spatial displacement. What we are witnessing, I'm not referring to geographical displacement. I'm just refer referring to displacing the contradictions from the production of from the space of production from the field of production to another space to the field of exchange. Uh, So, uh, of course, there is the problem of uh, there is a problem uh, of um, you, the credit use and knowledge about financial services in Turkey. Uh, the the studies, the index, for example, called uh, Turkey Economy Bankası. Uh, publishes such indexes from 2013 onwards. <coughs> the index shows that uh, women, students, unemployed and those living in the countryside form the disadvantaged groups in terms of access to finance and the use of financial services. But the problem, in, uh, again, in, in these indexes uh, and the strategy document is that uh, it's, it's not the financial sector, it's the people. They do not assume Investor positions, they do not assume saver positions. So the state, uh, there, there are 55 action plans within the strategy. Uh, the state organizes uh, multi-actor cam campaigns to overcome this problem of financial literacy and uh, education. Um, from, from 2010 and 2011 onwards, uh, you can we, you can see lots of campaigns, uh, Minister, Ministry of Family and Social Policy, and recently Ministry of Education uh, is the prominent figures is the pro prominent ministries regarding these campaigns. Uh, however, again, uh, as the the financial capability survey and the, as the index uh, composed by these financial institutions themselves show. Um, it can be said the problem does not just reside on the individual and household side. 66% uh, of Turkish adults reported, according to this financial capability survey, uh, reported that they have run short of money in the past for necessary goods and food. And 92% of them stated that it was because of low income. So what we are witnessing that witnessing is that like neglecting this. Uh, issue of low income and neglecting this issue of informal uh, sector. The most interesting thing uh, in in this financial inclusion campaign uh, is is that uh, this strategy and does not talk about microcredit in Turkey, but we have such a uh, microcredit sector developing. Uh, controlled by state and also supported by the infamous Grameen Bank. Uh, Turkey Israfı Önüme Vakfı and Grameen Bank collaborated in 2003 in Turkey Grameen Microcredit Program, and they they together they have extended credit to 45,000 women, and the credit volume has reached to uh, 140 million US dollars in the last decade. Uh, so, you do not see this state-controlled microcredit sector within the strategy document, and it's a state-organized sector, but uh, as stated by the 
microcredit program, their official aim is to convert borrowers into investors and financial consumers. So they, they promote the women, uh, the borrowers, to have bank accounts. They, uh, pr they encourage them to become a financial consumer, to uh, benefit from retirement plans, and to have long-term savings. So I will, <clears throat> I will try to conclude uh, with emphasizing the proactive role of the state in terms of <coughs> financial inclusion. Uh, now, the financial inclusion itself has become a state policy and it has become a performance criteria for various ministries and uh, various uh, branches within the state. For example, this, the drafting of financial inclusion strategy was the performance criteria for Under Secretariat of Treasury in their official strategy document. Um, so this Financial Stability Committee, composed of the heads of Treasury, Central Bank, Banking Regulation and Supervision Agency, and all other stuff, all the other usual suspects, they, um, they drafted this strategy and they assume a proactive role for promoting financial inclusion. Um, another specificity is the state control of microcredit. There is a slim chance that the microcredit sector will be commercialized in the near future. Uh, but this does not mean that the borrowers uh, are not becoming financial consumers. And Regarding the third pillar, the financial literacy and education, uh, it's the only pillar that state does not occupy the upper hand position. Uh, state collaborates with non-governmental organizations and commercial banks to organize uh, the financial literacy campaigns, but state has the uh, capacity to influence the agenda, as seen in family budgeting emphasis. So it's not the it's not women as, a, as an individual becoming a financial consumer. Thanks to the contribution of the uh, Ministry of uh, Family and Social Policy, it's always the family. It's always family and the household <coughs> becoming the financial consumer. Um, so so I'm, I'm, um, I'm trying to uh, deal with this notion of financial inclusion in Turkey uh, as an aspect of financialization. And I'm trying to show the proactive role of the state, and I'm, um, I'm, I have emphasized in the paper, and I, I hope to do it so in the article that this is this is um, this is um, this is also an aspect of financialization of the state. Um, I refer to financialization of the state as um, as the depolitization of economic management and depolitization of uh, important decisions regarding uh, economic sector without any popular control and without any popular intervention, and the use of strategies such as internationalization, as seen in uh, taking uh, advice from international financial institutions, modifying and ad adopting within the uh, national context. So it's not a direct transmission, but an adaptation. Uh, financial inclusion is is the motto of development community, and it's it's, uh, it's like an enchanter's land for many, but it's not like one-to-one -one, uh, direct transmission from international financial institutions to the national context. It's it's modification and adaptation, and it's done by the state. Uh, so uh, I, I have not gone into detail in the paper about pro progressive alternative to such kind of inclusion, uh, such kind of uh, financial inclusion campaigns, but I believe that it should be also our concern <coughs> to address the demand for credit uh, by uh, low income households and working class members, uh, but we should do so in a way that uh, that promotes uh, progressive alternatives and public control and popular control on economic sectors and financial sector. Thank you.
All right, so I'm playing both cameraman and moderator here. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for the contributions. Um, are there any questions to start off? Yes. Yes. So um, when I came to the room first time, they, there was no one here. Yet Kim was the only person. We ended up talking, and I ended up saying, "I'm kind of older than you are." <laughs> now I listen to all three of you. I feel even older because. I remember when microcredit first became available. That was Grameen Bank back in 1993. And one of the prerequisites of it was that you give money in small scale, but you did not tell people what to do with it. That was the prerequisite of original microcredit. But when IMF and World Bank adapted this policy, they changed it, to my understanding, as far as I can tell. A, they will still do small loading, but they will also do what to do with them. They will send it. Empowerment, you talked about. I'm wondering, in the Turkish case, what you have presented today, like this is a question for all of you, do you consider microcredit as a, a agent of empowerment in a positive sense, or are you, are you talking about it from the IMF's perspective or the way the IMF adapted the technique? Um, is it a negative thing? Right. Are, are we collecting questions or? Um, are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, first, I have a question for Yetkin. Uh, it's a very good study, thank you. I haven't come across any study that combines finance and agriculture, so it's very informative. Uh, but I have some hesitations <laughs> about sure. calling this financialization because it's a very it's something like credit-driven agricultural development. I, I couldn't see exactly why we call this financialization. Uh, and I s also think that it's important to focus on the unequal relationship between different agents because as you uh, very well tell that this relation is very different between large-scale producers and banks and between small-scale producers and banks. And I think this is uh, related to this unequal relationship. As the relation becomes more unequal, uh, so exploitation becomes more obvious. Uh, so I think it's important to focus on this point, the unequal, relationship, unequal, uh, relation, uh, unequal power relation between different agents. Why don't we take the first round of comments on these questions? Yeah. Uh, actually, um, I mean, one can trace back the microcredit phenomena, I believe, even to 1970s or 1980s. <coughs> uh, and I agree with you. I mean, it was not uh, commercialized, it was not financial. <coughs> uh, but the 1990s, uh, and especially the early 2000s, with the, uh, with the role of huge financial organizations and banks, and new methods to securitize the revenues of microcredits, so it became something else. Um, I'm I'm not sure we can we can take microcredit as an as an instance of empowerment. Uh, I mean, I'm, that's that's why I want to uh, conduct a field research, and uh, I don't know the number of uh, women who have uh, benefited from this microcredit campaign in Samsun and uh, the Black Sea region. But I will focus on this uh, region and I will try to understand. Uh, because I believe that no, no one asks about the uh, impact of microcredit in, in the economy. There is, there is this professor, uh, Milford Bateman, who talks about localization of the economy. Uh, but but the, there is no such study in Turkey as far as I know. So, so, uh, so we should look at that. But my concern is that uh, we can criticize the state authorities and policymakers uh, in their use of Grameen Bank, in their support to uh, to this uh, association, to this Israfa Nima Wakfu. 
and the use of especially the state-owned banks with commercial <coughs> and for-profit uses, but not for other purposes. We, you, you have the uh, huge financial actors, the state-owned banks, but, and thanks to this neoliberal restructuring of these banks, and uh, they have become like for-profit commercial banks, and now uh, extending credit to farmers or extending microcredits are, um, are not on their agenda. So what I try to suggest in the paper is that uh, we need to address, there's a problem there, uh, there's a demand for credit, and I may, I may, I may sound like an non-Marxist, but I'm, I'm, I'm going on. <laughs> Um, uh, but we should do it with a progressive political agenda uh, that necessitates to reclaim the state-owned banks, that necessitates to reclaim the state branches uh, to do so. Uh, to your uh, 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 question first, I'll, I'll just... Uh, talk about, like, uh, address your question about whether microcredits empower people or is something negative. Uh, um, it is being marketed as something empowering, right? Uh, that's a little bit more of the ideological uh, redressing, maybe. But it's just, I think, the consequence of a withdrawal of the welfare state. And it's just related to that dynamic of like withdrawal of the welfare state and introduction of market mechanisms as kind of like subsidizing people's livelihoods through usage of credits. But actually it's not subsidizing, it's putting people uh, at a disadvantage at different stages in different perspectives. So, and microcredits is just like the reflection like of further uh, financial inclusion. In that opinion, I mean, I think it's just it's not a matter of choice that people use their credits uh, in order to get involved in different economic activities, but they have to because they don't have any other choice, especially when I think about uh, small scale investments. Mm. Would you like to respond to it? Uh, would, you, would you like to go uh, first? To, uh, actually, I don't have an answer because yeah. <laughs> that's not a problem in housing, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not an economist. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but if I would say something, I would probably say very similar things to you. Uh, yeah. If can I have your uh, uh, definition of financialization? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> it, it's, it, it's, it, it, it's really fancy. No, like I, I would give you, but I just, just to elaborate like your question. Right? Uh, so I think that there are two aspects of financialization. One of them is uh, making money out of money using financial instruments. Right? That's the um, a pattern that uh, economic sociologists as well as economists use that instead of um, getting profits, driving profits out of uh, manufacturing as well as industrial production, uh, even uh, manufactur manufacturing industrial companies are investing in financial instruments to make money. That's, that's one aspect of financialization. The other aspect is, is this, uh, that is related to microcredits, expansion of uh, using credit usage like throughout the society so and that's where I'm a little bit more focusing on because I'm now looking at the production sphere and I'm looking at how small-scale producers whereas they were uh, getting benefits uh, from state supports uh, being uh, subsidies like input subsidies or price supports different mechanisms of state supports right shifting from all that system to a system where they uh, producing for corporations and have to use credits and that is being introduced as a system and their debt burden is being uh, in, like increased over time as well as uh, their maybe financial inclusion as being part of the financial system as credit takers mm -hmm. right kind of solidifies uh, they become part of this part of the system where they, they have to take that right to use credits and become like rational investors or entrepreneurs. So rather than, I mean, there are those two aspects which go hand in hand in my opinion. And that's, it, it doesn't, 
of course, that uh, this study doesn't uh, explain anything about uh, derivative markets. There, uh, like Koray Chilishkan uh, had worked on that area, had a book about that, right? Uh, how the prices of cotton actually is a, a result of speculation rather than uh, the price they farmers get at the farm gate, right? Like the, when they sell it, the prices is, is being determined somewhere else out on the derivative markets in, in future uh, markets and so on. So I'm, I'm not looking at that area, but I'm looking at more at the impacts of credit usage as a consequence of financialization, as a yeah. consequence of credit expansion. That's, that's how I relate the work. Uh, okay, this makes uh, it better if you say that uh, how agriculture has changed as a uh, result of financialization. Because yeah. what uh, I understand from financialization is something a major change in the relations between banks, the real sector, and the households, and it came from the uh, real sector, so it's something uh, more major. Uh, and actually, why I asked uh, this question uh, was because uh, you talked about 1980s in US, so I think uh, uh, during those times it wasn't called as financialization, mm. and it's something very similar to what happened today in Turkey. So it wasn't financialization, and why this is financialization? Yeah, so it's more like credit-driven agricultural development uh, uh, happening in a world which is financialized. I see. I mean, I think the, we see the uh, dynamics a little bit later then. I mean, Turkey is a little. Bit of course, it's not, uh, let's say, developed European country, but I think in terms of its economic structure, it resembles the more like continental European systems, yeah. at least sure. in in, uh, in agriculture. So um, we see a more we, s we had a more active involvement of state in agriculture, mm -hmm. whereas that started changing in the United States much earlier, in the 1980s with the uh, consecutive like financial. Uh, in, sorry, uh, the, um, instabilities in commodity markets and in prices, especially in agriculture, and related to that, the burden of the that burden of uh, farmers in the United States. So we see, I don't know, like what happened in the United States here. It's kind of happened a little bit lagged uh, later mm. in Turkey. I, it's not the same. It's not the similar, same thing. Dynamics all are different, but in terms of uh, just looking at the impacts of um, credit debt mm -hmm. on like farming households, we can, we can make an uh, analogy between those. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, the cr credit system a lot was a lot more established here in the United States uh, in farming than Turkey uh, back then. So. Yeah, I want to ask a more comparative. Uh, question. Um, so if I understand correctly, financial inclusion can happen through housing or it can happen through agriculture um, and so these two things are uh, part of what makes financial inclusion um, if I understand yeah, yeah know, it can be put uh, that way but, but financial inclusion is uh, if it is uh, what I understand um, that it's uh, in inclusion in the system really, in the financial system and this most likely happens through credit, through debt. Yeah. Um, so comparatively, for example, um, uh, comparing to the United States, um, what percentage of uh, households, for example, we, we know that uh, household debt has increased uh, tremendously in the past 10-12 uh, years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, has financial inclusion increased with the same rate um, uh, as the as the va as the uh, volume of the of, of debt, um, and how is that how is that related? And comparatively with the United States, like what percentage of the population are uh, finan are uh, financially included um, in okay. Turkey as opposed to? To here maybe in also uh, specifically in the in housing and, and in agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the uh, the debt figures in the United States uh, and their change, I don't know. I I have to look, but I mean I can 
say that in in the global north and countries like United States, uh, the according to the World Bank data, this uh, global index 2014, uh, it it revolves around 90 percent. 90 percent of the population is um, defined as financially included. They benefit from the services of formal financial system. Um, and the ratio declines sharply when it comes to countries like Turkey and countries of the global south. In Turkey, it changed slightly. Uh, I don't remember the Global Findex 2014, but Global Findex 2011. Um, 30 32 percent of uh, men, adult men, did not have a bank account in 2011, and it was 80, 81 percent of women. Uh, so overall, um, it was like a half a half of the population uh, was considered to be financially excluded. It changed slightly in the last three years, but I don't remember the exact ratio in Global Index uh, 2014. Uh, so, is there is there a dramatic change in this ratio uh, that goes parallel to the change in the volume of the household <coughs> debt? Yeah, the in problem. The past ten years. Yeah, like, the problem is, is that also the problem is that you can uh, one can calculate this for, for probably for United States and uh, but um, the data. Uh, is compiled from 2011 onwards. For index uh, composed by Turkey, uh, Turkey Economy Bankası, 2013 onwards. So we do not know mm. the situation in 2005 or 2006. Uh, but still, uh, it seems that there's a slight increase. Uh, people who are uh, benefiting from financial services, let's say, uh, but if you look at the credit card owners, of course, as uh, studies, as a, a, for example shows in one of her studies, uh, the number of credit card owners increased dramatically in, from 2003 to 2008. Mm. Uh, and there are some uh, reports Compo uh, written by FESU team, Financialization, Economy, Society, and Sustainable Development team, uh, which Özlem and Elif are a part. Uh, so these reports uh, uh, show that in the under the rule of Justice and Development Party, uh, the use of consumer credit increased tremendously, and thanks to this credit consumption boom, people saw became much more a part of the financial system. So that, that may be an answer. Mm -hmm. And you can reach the report public, it's public. The report is public on the page of the suit. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> I have a comment question for uh, Abiza. Uh, you talked about three main pillars uh, related to financial inclusion. And uh, I thought that in the case of Turkey, we might include one more, uh, which might be more rele relevant. Uh, it, and it is related to the uh, law that passed in 2010, as far as I remember. Uh, after this uh, legisl legislation, it became compulsory for uh, companies which employ uh, employee more than 10, I think, to deposit uh, wage and salaries through banks. And it was a major step for financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the main aims of this law was to prevent informal sector. So actually, I was surprised to hear that in, the, in these last reports, they don't talk about informal sector, because it's a very good way to uh, legitimize financial inclusion in Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were talking about this before, I know, but uh, probably in the last reports, uh, the emphasis shift on something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, the Global Development Report uh, of 2014 and this recent uh, policy paper by Demir Güçkunt mm -hmm. they mention uh, this as an opportunity uh, mm -hmm. if you make the corporations pay through banks if you 
if the states decide to pay through banks, deposit the uh, money into banks, this will help uh, increase financial awareness, financial inclusion, etc. So, so th they do not mention this in this strategy document, but yeah. probably uh, in 2017 and 2018 we will see another round of action plans and strategy documents. Probably uh, this will this will become a uh, this will be this will take its place in, mm -hmm. in these documents. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how to frame it as a pillar mm. uh, because despite the law that you mentioned. Uh, uh, I mean, it's it's um, it has not turned into a campaign. <coughs> just just a law that that makes it uh, obligatory to deposit if you deposit <coughs> into banks if you employ more than yeah. ten people. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they uh, they find the arrangement yeah, turkey yeah. informal uh, as always. Uh, yeah, <laughs> sector will not decline because of this law. <laughs> it's so obvious. But I think it's important because. Uh, this gives banks an opportunity to uh, to service many other financial services, you know, to provide, mm -hmm. to encourage the use of uh, credit cards, uh, market credit, uh, yeah, yeah. housing credit, and uh, other stuff for workers and for their families as well. I know many instances in which they send credit cards to the addresses when they have a when a worker have a bank uh, deposit in mm -hmm. them. All right, let me follow up with a more general word of questions. So there are different ways of defining financialization. You know, you can look at it from an institutional perspective of who's, what institutions or agents are included. We can look at it from a perspective of uh, how, you know, the ways, uh, how actions change. But the common thread throughout all these presentations today seems to be, at least, you know, in the realm of Turkey, the state is one of the key actors, both in shaping the institutions as well as shaping the actions driving institutionalization, uh, free financialization. So my question to probably all of you is, why? Like, what's the logic behind the government's actions or, you know, the, or the sequence of governments? What, what's the, why would a government or any, many governments in sequence uh, pursue a broad scale uh, policy of financialization in realms ranging from agriculture, household finance, housing finance, Credit, consumer credit, so on and so forth. I would suggest to frame the question, uh, reframe the question, because, um, and it can be formulated as a critique to the literature of financialization. Uh, it's a tendency to take credit money, credit relations as given. But it's, as we know, it's something always constructed and it needs always to be regulated and reframed. So the state has to be there always. Uh, it's, it's the problem of the scholars and researchers that do not take into account when they talk about the increased revenues uh, from financial operations, increased revenues of non <coughs> corporations. It's a, it's a problem. You, they should take into account the role of states. Uh, the legal regulations and the restructuring of the state. And in Turkish case, uh, that, was my, that was my research about in previous years. We need to take into account the state fictitious capital in 1980s and 1990s. We need to take into account the construction of the sovereign debt market in Turkey, which, uh, which was also the construction of the mechanism that enabled a huge transfer from public to financial capital. Um, but still, uh, still we can, I mean, uh, we can question the centrality of state uh, probably more than other places, other other countries in global south, maybe, um, but I don't have an answer for that. And I need to think about that. Uh, okay, in let's say in geography, the relation between states and space is a big thing, of course. Uh, but from my perspective, and especially for Turkey, there are two things related to the state. The first thing is rescaling of the state is a major issue in Turkey. In the uh, the transformation of space 
And the second thing is the special intervention of the state. So how state intervenes through the processes. So in, a, in the Marxist literature, of course, this is, this is ar argued in the Marxist literature. So there are other discussions in non-Marxist literature. Uh, but in, a, in the Marxist literature, the whole literature is mainly domin dominated by regulationist school, and especially by Jessup, and which reframes regulationism through strategies and strategic relation approach. But for me, I think uh, there's, an, there's another answer for that, beyond regulations school, is coming from a much more open Marxist perspective, and understanding state not as the, uh, let's say, the hub of collecting all the uh, pressures, and then deciding what to do as interventions, they call it selectivity, that's why they call it selectivity, and selects what to do next. Rather, the state works as an, um, uh, sorry, as a, as a social unity, uh, which works uh, through the, which uh, gives responses to the conflicts which are created through the relations between between the developer and the developers, between the state and the developer. So, so the state tries to respond to that crisis, but of course it's not possible to overcome them. So that's why it is a process, and that's why we don't call it selectivity, and that's why it, is, it includes relations, that's why it is an intervention. So. It is a whole process, like a historical process, but also it changed through time and through, through, different, uh, through different localities, as we see in the Turkish case. For example, in Istanbul, uh, the, the national state or even the local state did not intervene similarly in uh, scratch settlements when they were doing the urban regeneration. They were all different. So the state was the same state, but the interventions were different. So I think what we need to see is uh, in the special transformation uh, the two things, the rescaling and interventions of uh, the state, but for the, the, role, the, the major role of Turkey, the major role of the state in Turkey, uh, especially in the special development, is a heat, they, they have a huge land stock, uh, especially in the valuable lands of the cities, so it is a big plus for the state. And uh, also uh, the urban regeneration process targeted at the whole neighborhood uh, it is the first time which, uh, which was targeted in the whole neighborhood because it was normally the apartments or the, the one house itself so the resistance against urban regeneration was coming from the whole neighborhood that's why the national state must be there to respond it it wasn't possible to do by any other force so there, I mean, there, there are different uh, let's say peculiarities of the Turkish state itself, but I think I agree with uh, Adiza. Uh, I think the role of the state is uh, major in all of the countries. Yeah, yeah I, I, I will agree with that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like the uh, state that you need to have regulation to have markets, right? Like, so we, we cannot have markets without the rules. And but like how those are how how those rules are being determined or set is is a really active process as Islam said is an active process of negotiation. But I find Jessup's argument like really useful <laughs> because I think he adds a lot. That's a little bit of the uh, discussion we can go on about yeah, that see. later too. But I think the uh, uh, how the state like the regulating mechanisms react upon uh, different cases differently even though we have the same regulating mechanism I think this is very much related with with just uh, like not like wild contingency but uh, th th there's a lot of like e economic as well as extra economic dynamics so and uh, just going back to the to the to the essence of the question, why does state intervene makes all these regulations or uh, why is it necessary for state involvement for, for us to have the, the process called financialization, right? So that's the kind of the essence of the question. Or why, why do we see it being so active in financialization as though we, are, we, we don't want to think about the state 
but just like the market mechanisms in financialization. Maybe, but my question was also about why the state, if the state is engaged in it, why would it use, you know, methods of financialization? Ah. Like, what's... I'll, I'll give you a real orthodox answer then, just crisis, crisis of capitalism, right? <laughs> so, I mean, because the state doesn't have any other choices, I guess, right? So, it, uh, globalization. It, yeah, so, I mean, globalization as well as I mean, the, the financial crisis, the budget crisis started in, starting in the late 70s, and, and especially in the Turkish context, crisis that followed like 80s, 90s. The state had no other choice, I guess, to, I mean, seeing all the financial, uh, of course, everyone can contribute on that, but the uh, state seeing no other uh, choices in terms of uh, based on the forest or state supported uh, capitalism, sustain that model of capitalism, had in order to uh, go on with the type of capitalism they had to shift to, to a more pre for this capitalism that we've seen before the 1930s or so. I mean, of course, it is, it is a different form. We have, we have a lot stronger corporations and so on, but. Uh, I think it is, I mean, Fordism, state-supported capitalism, was a form to, to make uh, capitalism survive, because otherwise it was going to be drawn by it in its own uh, crisis. But then the end of the Fordist uh, period was the conflicts. I mean, internal conflicts as well as like, social, all social uh, reactions to that and everything. Like, we shouldn't really exclude uh, social dynamics from economic dynamics. We cannot really explain everything about economic dynamics, right? But I think it's just uh, the merger of all these dynamics. Uh, that, that's the thing that brought us here, I guess. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to Yetkin, to clarify uh, your conclusion uh, about the study, uh, you're, you're not uh, saying that we should get rid of this dispossession argument, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just uh, it depends on the sector, it depends on the geography, it depends on the region. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, and uh, there is in terms of uh, defaults, like uh, defaults on credits. Let's say when we look at uh, total credit use, compare that to defaults, like credits not being able to be repaid mm -hmm. by farmers, it's like around four percent. It's been like in 2008, I guess, like the earliest data that I could find according to the uh, banking regulation agency. And then it didn't, that person, that proportion did not change too much. It was like between 3 and 4% uh, at the end of like 2014, of course. It shows an increase over time. I mean, I'm using obviously the uh, default credit threat as an indicator of dispossession. Right? Mm -hmm. so, but uh, I mean, it, we have this possession, definitely. But then there is like an ongoing business, right? Ongoing participation of small-scale farmers, or small-scale investors uh, who are using who use credits. I'm trying to explain, uh, in a way, one of the potential consequences. What, what happens to those people? So uh, that's one thing. And, and another thing, maybe about this possession, especially in agricultural production. So. I said like there was a decrease in agricultural employment from eight millions to six millions, but actually it was worse uh, mid two thousands. Like the uh, number of uh, uh, people working in agricultural employment went down to five million people, and then over time it increased like gradually by one million. With, uh, someone needs to look at that, like about why the why that happened, uh, how that happened, right? Because there are different subsidies now in a, um, uh, state support subsidies uh, for di different sectors, but in different forms, in order to integrate producers more in corporate markets, uh, rather than the state being the active uh, regulate, uh, like active purchaser, right? active customer uh, through different uh, mechanisms. So uh, there has been like a really dip, like really strong dip, uh, decline over time, but then there has been a uh, since 2006 or 2007, there has been like a really slow increase. So, 
my point is we cannot really talk about a really strong trend of dispossession, right? There is still, the majority of producers are still there. Uh, there has been losses, right? Uh, we need to, of course, look at the, uh, who has been exploited a lot more in detail. But yeah, I'm basically saying that uh, dispossession and exploitation through different mechanisms go hand in hand together. Maybe I'll play the devil's advocate then follow up on Elif. Uh, so if you, if you read in a Graeber, David Graeber, you know, he's, you know, he refers to all these uh, extensive history of credit and how they essentially originated from agricultural relationships. Right? The, the seasonal issue of you know, crops that you have to you know, plant the seeds, so you have to take out the loans as a farmer from the merchant from most probably, and then you know, until when, when harvesting season comes around, you can actually repay the merchant with uh, the harvest. Um, so in that sense, maybe agriculture is the origin of financialized industry, right? So my question would be, what's different about it now? Mm. Yeah. And the second question that I would like to ask is about you know, this position defined in terms of defaults, right? You, you know, appropriation of um, uh, the property of the farmer by the bank. From the perspective of the bank, it's not necessarily a good thing. Right? Banks, banks won't try to avoid defaults, mm -hmm. okay? Especially on property, on assets that have a falling value. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, exploitation or dispossession does not necessarily manifest itself through the default, through mm -hmm. the formal legal transfer of property, but through the mechanisms in you know, how farmers operate. Right? The, the, people, you know, the, 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 the bigger kind of the share of revenue that goes to credit repayments, that's the uh, dispossession, not necessarily the default or the uh, transfer of assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. But those are really good points. So what is different is that, uh, I mean, uh, I tried to address that question. Good. I, I got that question previously as well. The, the thing is that um, we had that pattern, right, like in agriculture, but a lot more at smaller scale, especially in, in Turkish case, because uh, the commercialization in Turkey was not as extensive. Uh, as now, previous. Right now, like everyone is, like all, most of the household, you cannot talk about like subsistence farmers anymore. Or like a really, a really marginal part where like someone just consumes whatever they produce and they don't sell anything else. We can, we are talking about more like smaller scale commercial farms who like maybe have like a plot for themselves to uh, uh, sustain their subsistence, their livelihood, but at the same time, uh, probably, uh, bigger portion of their production is for cash, right? To, to earn credits, uh, to earn, sorry, money, profits. And we had that system, the uh, uh, consolidation of that simple commodity production system throughout the welfare system, the welfare state period, like from 30s up to 80s in, in Turkey. And that really, that was heavily supported by uh, state enterprises, as well as like, state support, state subsidies and so on. So what, what is different now is that the expansion of that uh, credit dependent production system. So the scale is different first and uh, that uh, credit uh, dependent production uh, oriented, uh, targeted at, directed at uh, corporations needs, right? Trying to meet corporations demands. So that is uh, something uh, very new as well. Like the, this is really, previously we had like uh, smaller merchants, small scale merchants, who are more interested in exporting maybe, but like the extent of that was at a smaller scale. Whereas now the credit dependent production pretty much defies the system, right? So that is the difference. And that's why we can talk more about a, a shift in the regime and the, in the accumulation system. And so that's, that will be my um, uh, answer to that. And uh, whether defaults are a good, uh, proxy uh, for dispossession and if exploitation or like the a loss of profits to corporations could be uh, described as dispossession. I think that like dispossession is a really useful concept, but I think we need to uh, define it a little bit more concisely, you know, like have some limits because we can 
uh, define anything as dispossession. So dispossession really means that uh, that you have to hand over something, right? Either, either by force or by uh, as a result of uh, like a credit debt, you have to lose it. So it's it's a really common story in, in Turkey that people lose their lose their investments, lose their uh, land or uh, like their tractors, other inputs they have, the investments they had. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know if it is a problem. What, what you say is makes a lot of sense that banks wouldn't want to uh, appropriate but still get paid, right? Because it will be fast for them like, to appropriate, take that uh, asset and try to sell it or, or maybe run by themselves, right? But uh, there is like appropriation going on as well. And uh, there, there are times that farmers just commit suicide uh, because they have uh, overwhelmed by that, right? Uh, in Turkey, it's an increasing uh, trend, although it's not covered in newspapers, right? And then, I mean, if you look at other countries where there's heavier uh, debt burden, like India, uh, farmer suicide is a, is a big issue, right? And that, that comes as a result of uh, debt burden and people not really knowing how, what to do, what else to do uh, as a result of this process. So, uh, and I think default, even though well, I didn't explain all the dispossession, it might be manageable, like the uh, credits on default uh, might be managed somehow, uh, might be renegotiated, there might be, uh, I don't know what it is called in English, but the state might uh, forgive the debts and so on, because in, in Turkey especially, most of the agricultural debt, like agricultural credit is provided by uh, a culture bank, which is a public bank, right? Uh, so, uh, but it is, it is defaults are related to this possession, and it is happening. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think, um, isn't it also possible that a big uh, portion of this possession might happen to prevent defaults? Mm -hmm. Like they could be selling their house, they could be selling their tractor, mm -hmm. their their car. Like yeah. they could be dispossessing yeah. to prevent. Uh, default and they make the payment to the bank yeah. and they close their credit card or whatever. Yeah, and yeah. yeah that, that's another thing, but that shows itself as like withdrawal, withdrawing from the sector, right? So yeah. then we, we, that's actually might be one of the factors why we see less and less people participating, like a decline in the number of producers. So yeah, that's, that's definitely one of the factors. And probably one very obvious you know, example of dispossession is urban renewal, right? Yeah. When you have to turn over your house first, and uh, that's kind of the, uh, probably the most explicit portion of it. All right. Uh, are there any more questions? If not, then I would like to thank the audience and the panelists here today, and uh, we'll be posting the video. Depending on how fast we can edit it, uh, probably sometime this week, I presume. And you can find that video on our website, and also I'll post it on Facebook, uh, just in case uh, you don't forget to the website. Thanks. Oil, she was also the best one. Oil, she was.